Welcome to the 2020 Farm Science Review Gwyn Conservation Area Virtual Presentation of Attracting Beneficial Insects, Pollinators, Predators, and Parasites. My name is Curtis Young and I am with Ohio State University Extension out of the Van Wert County Extension Office, where I am the Agriculture and Natural Resource Extension Educator. First thing we have to do is consider some of the aspects of beneficial organisms and what we need to pay attention to when we're trying to attract them into a particular area. Remember, these are biological organisms and as biological organisms, they are going to have requirements from their environment for their growth, development, and survival. They may require a very stable environment to be able to survive for any great periods of time. They, if they don't have all that they need in a particular environment, they just get up and leave when resources are low. So we have to be aware that if we don't continuously do things to attract and maintain them, they may not hang around very long. One of the aspects of these biological organisms will be that we need to protect them and we need to provide them with alternative re food resources when their main food is not available. And one of the things that we're referring to there is if you're dealing with predators and parasites, if their host species is not present for them to attack, they will need other sources of food to at least get them through those times of, of deficient numbers of prey. And many times that is um, having pollen and nectar available for them when their prey is not available. These biological organisms can be susceptible to different types of environmental disturbances or disruptions. The, the stability of their environment can be very important to them both establishing in an area as well as maintaining themselves for periods of time. What kind of disruptions of the stability of an environment can be important to beneficial organisms? Well, things that can disrupt their life cycles include, if it happens to be in a cropped area, um, harvest. When that crop is harvested, if there is not a cover crop available for them to move into or an alternative crop for them to move into, um, that can be the end of those particular beneficial organisms. Monocropping. If there is only one type of plant or very limited plant diversity in the area, there may not be alternative environments for them to move into. Some major disruptions would include plowing and cultivation or mowing of the fields that they may be living in uh, for any number of purposes. Uh, plowing, of course, is going to de destroy all plant material in the immediate vicinity. Then, of course, pesticides. Insecticides, obviously, are designed to kill insects directly. Fungicides may have indirect impacts. Some fungicides actually have some insecticidal qualities to them. And then herbicides reduce the plant diversity in the local area. What do pollinators, predators, and parasites need specifically? Well, of course, they need food, both their primary food as well as alternative foods. They need shelter for breeding sites as well as simply places to survive in severe weather times and protection from pesticides. food. Of course, if it's a, a pollinator type of insect like the bumblebees on the sedum plant there, they do need the nectar and pollen continuously from their food resources. Our predators, such as the lacewing larva that we see to the right-hand side, 
is going to need a source of prey to consume. Uh, without that prey to consume, they will die of starvation. And for parasitoids, they typically need their hosts inside of which to rear their young. So there's a, a number of different food resources that are required by these beneficial insects. Some may have multiple needs and others may simply need one type of, of, of food to consume on a regular basis. Providing pollen and nectar. Uh, that's what the flowers are primarily doing for these different insects. Nectar is a ready, ready source of energy, carbohydrate, as well as amino acids. And the pollen provides protein for a number of different types of insects. You can see over there on the right-hand side, uh, both a honeybee as well as a blister beetle, both acquiring pollen and nectar from the cup plant that was in a prairie area. Providing pollen and nectar, there's a number of goals that we're uh, shooting for. Uh, one is to use a wide diversity of plant species, annuals, perennials, shrubs, and trees. And part of the reason for using all these different types of plants is each of these plants will most likely bloom at a different time of the year. Patches of plants rather than single plants will give a better opportunity for the insects to find them as well as to utilize them. Provide a diversity in flower size, shape, and structure uh, for a number of different types of insects can only use certain shapes or colors of flowers uh, as well as some flowers are very selective or co-evolved with specific pollinators and only allow certain ones to get to the rewards for pollination. Provide a continuous bloom from early spring through late fall. Uh, and we don't or can't tolerate the big gaps in blooming periods through uh, any time of the season. Otherwise, your beneficial insects may uh, perish because of starvation. Uh, and for prey types of species, there would is a need for host plants to support butterfly caterpillars, as well as other types of, of insects that are utilized by the predators and parasites. Variety in flower structure. Uh, as you can see here, there are many types of shapes and flower structures that are utilized by many different types of insects. And not every insect can use every flower shape. And so we have to be aware of selecting different uh, here's uh, quite a diversity of different types of flowers to be thinking about from the milkweed to the uh, the aster flowers uh, to uh, tube flowers. Some of these have flowers that have to be mechanically opened by the, the pollinator. And so if the insect isn't big enough to open those flowers, it's not going to be able to utilize them. Uh, colors will be attractive to different insects. You know, the colors that we see aren't necessarily the colors that the pollinators see as well as the other types of insects. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind when selecting a diversity of different plants to utilize for attracting these beneficial insects. Um, different types of pollinators use different types of flowers based on color as well as on on uh, shape of the flower and when the flower is blooming. And so uh, you, you can find charts such as the one that you see here at a number of different locations, which um, will give you the characteristics of the different flowers that will be attractive to the different types of pollinators or insects and other animals that will utilize them for their pollen and nectar. What seems to be a weed to some may actually be an incredibly good pollinating plant or food resource to many of these beneficial organisms. Here you see a large bumblebee using obedient plant, um, but uh, there's also you know, weeds that are used or things that might be considered a, a weed by some uh, may be excellent pollinators to the different insects 
as well as to uh, predators and parasites. Uh, things like the ironweed, the milkweed, and goldenrod all provide um, an opportunity to feed at different times of the growing season. When selecting plants, we absolutely need to be careful of not selecting ones that are classified as noxious weeds. Uh, there are lists of Ohio noxious weeds to avoid. Uh, here you see a web address for an OSU website called the Farm Office. And in one of the blogs, they have a listing of the current Ohio noxious weeds. And we should avoid those uh, whenever selecting plants to utilize in a, a uh, area that we're trying to attract these types of insects. Unfortunately, noxious weeds are found throughout Ohio. Some are incredibly prevalent and others are only found in certain locations. Uh, don't make the situation worse by uh, propagating these types of plants. And the two that we see in this slide are poison hemlock on the left and wild parsnips on the right. Unfortunately, both these plants are very attractive to all kinds of insects. Uh, but uh, we don't need to be increasing their numbers within the state. Just like the noxious weeds, there are also invasive plant species that we need to avoid as well. Here is the web address to the Ohio Department of Agriculture's list of invasive plants that would be necessary to avoid. I'm, uh, just like the noxious weed, unfortunately, we have numerous invasive plants that are found throughout the state of Ohio. And once again, we don't need to make the situation worse by planting more of them, uh, such as the tree of heaven that we see in the slide uh, picture. When we're looking to um, select a variety of different plants that will bloom at different times of the year, just like with the uh, different pollinator plants for different animal species. There are also lists out there of different uh, plant species, what their colors of flowers may be, when they flower, and how long they flower, so that one can choose throughout an entire growing season as to what kind of trees, shrubs, annuals, and perennials to select from. Uh, and these lists are quite extensive and can be uh, fairly specific to certain parts of the country. So be sure you do get the list that is appropriate for Ohio. Here are a number of trees and trees. Perennial flowers of a number of different species, as well as vines and other types of plants included there. What about the winter? Um, these plants may provide shelter uh, throughout the winter time. Uh, so we do want to leave plants with their fruits or seeds still standing out in the field. Uh, they may be the overwintering site. There may be offspring still developing in different parts of the plant uh, or like the old log with loose bark on the outside of it, it may be a, a sheltering site for a number of different insect species. Uh, so these plants can be functional even in a part of the year when the insects aren't overly active, uh, but are still sheltering within the local area. There is a emphasis to using native plants in native types of areas, uh, partially because they are already well adapted to our climate. They can tolerate a wide variety of growing conditions in some cases. And of course, they are usually fairly low maintenance and beneficial for our native pollinators, once again, because they have co-evolved with these pollinators. Some things to consider when selecting different plants is um, how to spread these out throughout a, an area where you're planting them, uh, what uh, to plant the uh, different species in groups rather than uh, sparsely 
dispersed across an area. It's easier for pollinators and other insects to find them when they're in groups rather than spread out. Be careful, even if it is a native plant, if it is a, a modern selection that is a hybrid of those plants, such as the double-flowered cone flowers, uh, these hybrids may not be nearly as functional as the original species. And then, of course, um, those flowers that maintain their flowers open throughout the nighttime are functional for a number of species of night-flying insects, especially the moths, as well as animals such as bats. Planting in groups, here you can see a couple of different examples of how to group plants together. On the left-hand side are cosmos flowers in a large grouping behind a fence in a type of flyway uh, uh, area. And then on the right-hand side, you can see several other examples of group plants of color as well as common species. Again, to make it easier for these different insects to find and utilize them on a regular basis. Where to get native plants? Well, there are a number of different nurseries that specialize in native plants. Uh, there are seed companies that you can get catalogs uh, to acquire seeds of these native plants. The one thing to be careful of uh, when you're purchasing seeds, however, is that you need to look at the purity of the seeds in the packaging. And hopefully it's from a reliable resource that has that tested. Uh, be careful of buying these seeds from out of state because every state does not have the exact same criteria when it comes to um, making certain that there are not noxious weed species within seed mixes. Um, so be very aware of that and very careful. Uh, um, we don't want situations where buying these native seeds bring in some very noxious weeds, uh, such as Palmer amaranth, uh, which is a southern weed species that unfortunately has been brought into the state of Ohio and is incredibly difficult to manage once it is established. And then there are um, local plant cells that are conducted by uh, different gardening groups as well as different arboreto within the state. Uh, you just have to uh, watch for their announcements whenever they are carrying out these native plant sales. Shelter for um, different types of insects comes in many different forms. And so let's have a look at some of these. The shelter is necessary to protect um, both predators, parasites, and, and pollinators from severe weather as well as predation while they are in their overwintering state. Uh, the uh, shelter may also simply be their nesting site, and that can be in the soil, uh, it can be in dead branches of trees, hollowed out trees, and uh, or even uh, canes of different types of perennial plants can be used for nesting sites. A number of our solitary bees will dig holes down into the ground uh, or they may use the tunnels that have been excavated by other insects in poles and trees and other plant material. Uh, some of our social bees like the bumblebees um, use small cavities or um, they can utilize old rodent burrows and nests that were used by these animals during the winter. Uh, there you see a stump with some borer holes into the stump that could be used by solitary bees. And then on the right hand side is an example of digger bees. And they prefer particular types of soil into which they can dig easily. And that tends to be uh, well-drained soils, so sandy soils, um, especially in recreation areas like uh, sand volleyball pits. The edges of those pits can be very attractive to solitary bees, uh, as well as sand traps on golf courses, um, sandboxes and playgrounds. So um, it could potentially bring 
uh, the solitary bees into conflict with people uh, because of the habitats they select. However, uh, they're typically not overly aggressive. Man-made types of bee um, shelters. Uh, you see a variety of them depicted here in the images. Uh, a lot of these are for solitary bees like orchard bees uh, and some of the uh, other cavity dwelling bees. Uh, di uh, so uh, hollow stems of different diameters or even blocks of wood that have simply had holes drilled into them with different drill bit sizes can be used by the solitary bees for their breeding sites. Um, other what look like somewhat debris can be sheltering sites for a number of different types of insects as well. Uh, here you can see a hollow tree that the hollowed out interior of the tree uh, could be utilized for overwintering purposes. Now, the, the one thing to be careful of is some of these uh, reeds and other types of uh, drilled holes uh, can be contaminated over time by uh, different types of mite species that can be damaging to these solitary bees. So they may need to be cleaned out and replaced on a somewhat regular schedule for them to continue functioning appropriately. Here you can see a, a very conducive site for digger bees. All of those little mounds of soil that you see throughout that driveway uh, are uh, holes for solitary bees that have dug down into the soil there. Uh, those uh, need to be protected and not feared uh, whenever one encounters them. Most of the time you can walk through these areas without any uh, interference or threat from the, the digger bees. And there's an example of one of those little digger bees bringing the soil up out of the ground. Um, and that's a, a typical digger bee appearance when they're outside of the hole. Again, these are solitary. They're not colonial in terms of helping one another, but they may appear in great numbers in a locale simply because it's a very conducive site for digging. Uh, again, uh, in certain more... Uh, uh, obvious areas, uh, different, more attractive types of arrangements can be made uh, for attracting these different types of bees into the area. Water is an, uh, a necessary resource as well, and if it's not readily available from a pond or a stream, it may need to be provided to support these different some things to, to be aware of is uh, if there isn't a natural source of water, they can resort to uh, places like swimming pools, which can bring them into conflict with humans, as well as these pools are not conducive for their safety of these insects. Uh, a good watering site will be relatively shallow, um, have sloping sides to it so that the insects could get out of the watering area easily or have a number of stones or other objects in the shallow water so that they can uh, steady themselves on these rocks uh, and be able to take off and land without getting trapped in the water. Protection from pesticides is also important as mentioned earlier. Uh, we have to uh, consider if they need to be used uh, and what ones are selected. And it, it goes for all the different types of pesticides, whether it is an insecticide, fungicide, or herbicide. Insecticides are dangerous to most insects slash arthropod species. Uh, so we need to constantly keep that in mind. Um, herbicides can kill potential food sources uh, and you know, most of the herbicides are not directly toxic to the insects. However, some fungicides may have insecticidal properties to them. Whenever using an insecticide, use insecticides that are as selective as possible, meaning that they are very narrow in what they will target and kill. As with using any pesticide, 
read the label carefully and follow the instructions precisely. That label has been designed for safety to the user as well as providing minimal risk to non-target organisms. Apply when pollinators are less active in there. You'll have to know uh, what periods of the day are better to choose. Usually that's relatively early in the morning or late in the evening uh, so that the, the pollinators that would typically be visiting those flowers would have either not arrived yet or have left to go back to their uh, nesting sites. And then, of course, spot treatments are preferred over uh, broadcast treatments. Uh, use as little as possible in the vicinity of the area where you're trying to attract beneficial insects. And then the final things will be to let people know what you're doing on your property. Uh, to some people, to see what appears to be an unkept area. Uh, is a an eyesore rather than an environmental protected area uh, and be cognizant of the fact that if some undesirable plants are developing in that area they may have to be dealt with such as unfortunately um, in these areas that are being naturalized uh, sometimes we get some of these invasive species that will move in, such as Canada thistle. And Canada thistle can spread by seed fairly easily. So there may be some conflict between neighbors um, because of the Canada thistle invasiveness. And there may be some uh, legal matters that may arise uh, where Canada thistle is considered a noxious weed and there are noxious weed laws that prohibit allowing those types of plants to get out of hand. And finally, um, there are a number of resources out there available on the internet to help individuals select plant material um, that is best for attracting pollinators and the predators and parasites, such as the Xerxes Society. Uh, you see their web address there. Uh, pollinator Partnership, and then the Ohio State Bee Lab and Pollinitarium, uh, the beelab.osu.edu. And they can provide a lot of useful information for improving habitats for all three of the insect types of interest, pollinators, predators, and parasites. Hope you enjoyed the Farm Science Review virtual um, presentation this year. Hope to see you in person next year.